Um, so the next thing I wanted to do on this subject is talk about the issue of, of how to actually help yourself release your false beliefs. Right? Uh, because, it, because obviously these false beliefs have entered us and they've entered us through this emotional pathway that's been constructed in error. And as these false beliefs have entered us and constructed this pathway through us, now these false beliefs get settled into, into the next, uh, you could say the next set of events is being created. So these false beliefs become the construction process of your next set of events in your life as a result of that. So what we want to do is start looking at what, how can we release these false, event, uh, false beliefs. Remember these false beliefs are sort of construct this pathway, if I draw it like that, through your soul. So here's your soul, and so that's not the earth, that's the soul. And, uh, and there's the pathways going through there's that, that your false belief has constructed. And, and they've settled in you emotionally. So this is emotional error that's now settled within you. So now what we, and of course we're, because we're a construction in process, obviously there's a lot more to happen. Now this is a very obvious, simplistic way of explaining your soul, because your soul is actually the most complex creation that God has ever created. All right, so, so what I'm doing here is trying to simplify <laughs> the most complex creation that God has ever created. And if you look at what creations, other creations God has made, you will get some idea of how complicated your own soul must be inside of itself in terms of the mechanisms involved. So we've constructed this pathway, if you like, this neural network pathway, I suppose you could explain it as, inside of yourself, but it's an emotional pathway. It's inside of yourself that cause these false beliefs to centre with and to be attracted to. Now, the issue is we want to get back to the emotions, don't we? Because it's the emotions that allowed these false beliefs to enter. So at some point we want to deconstruct the emotion that allows false beliefs to be attracted to me firstly and then enter me so that they settle within me. So the way we have to do that obviously is we have to get to the emotion itself at some point. But most of us struggle a lot in getting back to the emotion. And, so what we, and, and there's a number of reasons why. One of the primary reasons why we struggle to get back to the emotion is that the belief system, so this belief system, was created to support the denial of that emotion. All right? That's why we're struggling to get to the emotion because all of our belief systems were constructed to actually help us get away from our emotion in the first place. So what do we do with that? We have to, firstly, the first thing we need to start doing is being honest about our belief systems. Particularly honest about whether our belief systems are loving or unloving. Right. And this, is, this gets down to how do we tell or how can we allow any belief system to enter our soul? Because obviously what I've defined up till now is that all these belief systems, a lot of them are entering us because of all of these emotional errors that we have and this allows all these belief systems. So in the end, how do I know what's true and what's not? Right? And the answer is really quite simple. The truth is always loving. So a belief system that's loving in all its aspects will be more harmonious with truth than a belief system that is unloving in all of its aspects. And the more love there is in the belief system, the more truth there must also be in the belief system. Now let's put this back into play with the belief system of reincarnation for a moment. Right. <coughs> Belief system of reincarnation basically as it's been presented in the past has been that I live a life, a certain life on earth of a certain time, I pass into the spirit world, I have this sort of life review process and then I revisit earth again to actually work through the karma of the previous life. And I can't work through the karma of the spirit, previous life in the spirit world, I must work through the karma or the damage if you like of what you've done in the past through the earth experience. But the only problem is that I can't remember my previous experience. <coughs> <laughs> I 
Now, does this sound like a loving process to you? That you're being forced to come back down to earth to work through your previous experience's karma, but the only trouble is you can't remember the previous experience in its entirety to know what the karma was. All right? Now, how does that feel to you? Doesn't that feel unfair? Does that feel loving? Not really, does it? It feels unfair to, to us. I, I, could make, I could understand the creation of a system that actually where you remember your previous life and then you're asked to look, work through the karma of it. You could understand that, couldn't you? More than you could understand that you can't remember your previous life and then you have to work through the karma of what you can't remember. And then there's all these things, oh, we only can't remember because... Um, that we try to forget. Well, that to a degree is true. There's a truth in that from the soul level, but, but like many of you have tried with all of your heart to remember all of your previous life's karma and have never discovered it. And in fact, when you think about it, I only remember one or two or three events of my previous life, like the important events, like where I was born perhaps, where I lived, and also probably how I died. But what about all the damage I did in between? I can't remember that. I can't remember you know, what actually happened, all of that. Even though you try your hardest and you might even go to therapist, a past life therapist, after past life therapist, still can't find it. Now, is it loving for somebody to create a system that actually <coughs> creates a lot of difficulty for you in terms of discovery of your own truth about yourself? Now, you know, you'd have to start considering, is this belief really loving? So what we would do then, what we're able to do inside of our soul, is we're able, just by asking the question, is this belief really, really loving, or is it just a little bit loving, or is it not loving at all? In that way, we're able to easily differentiate between whether we should allow this belief to enter us emotionally or not. Can you see that? just by asking that one question, is this belief loving? Now, the only problem with that is our beliefs of love are distorted. So what do we do with that? And that's where our emotions come to play. You see, if we have the... understand one basic truth, and you can test this truth as well, and the basic truth is this. If I feel all of my emotions, I will in the end come to discover the truth. But I have to be diligent in feeling all of my emotions. All right? Now the problem is that most of us have lots of emotions of fear that cover over our real emotions. So that means also we're going to have to feel all of our fears as well before we're going to be able to discover truth. And if you can just even, if, if we can say to anybody, as long as we feel all of our emotions, we will in the end come to discover truth, people will have no trouble determining in the end what the truth is about any single subject that you could present to them. Scientific, like, so any physical, chemical subject you could, you could present to them, any medical subject you can prevent to them, present to them, all of these subjects will all be covered by what is going on inside of regarding love. Does that make sense? As long as we feel all of our emotions, we will come to discover the truth about every single subject that we ask the question of. So, if we use that as a guideline to accepting truth, and we can experiment. You don't even have to believe what I'm saying to you right now because all you need to do is for six months experiment with it. Can you see that? And this is the thing we need to present to others who are finding difficulty maybe on the divine love path is all you need to do is experiment for six months with your emotions. And notice what happens inside of yourself. And notice what happens to your law of attraction. And notice what happens to all of these other things that are going on including your fears, and let yourself fully experience your emotion. But as you know, the majority of us are very resistive to experiencing all of our emotion. And so when a person comes back and says, 
tried that for six months but I only experienced one emotion and therefore I don't believe it's the truth. Well, you're going to have to experience more than one emotion before you'll be able to determine truth. Right? Because we have so many emotional blockages which are covered over by all of these fears which prevent us from actually deconstructing the false beliefs and actually allowing the truth to enter ourselves. And that's what we've got to consider in the process. But there's really only two rules about truth and they're the two that I've just mentioned and that is the truth is always loving. Always, and I'll rub out the best bit. Truth is always loving. And the second thing is truth is always emotional. Ow. Sorry about that. Truth is always emotional. In other words, you can hear truth in your head as much as you want. It will never become a part of your soul until your soul emotionally accepts this truth or until the emotion preventing the truth from entering the soul is released so that you can accept the truth. Right? But if we remember that the truth is always loving and the truth is always emotional and we can experiment with that in our lives. We can experiment in our day-to-day -day lives about that. That's all right, thanks. <coughs> what, um, what about emotions of self-deception? Yep. Where does that... You know, like you say, it's, it's always emotional and then um, say, for example, I was feeling emotion and emotion, it was actually an emotion of self-deception. I felt that for six months. Yeah, but the question is, is self-deception loving? Well, I might deceive myself that it is. True. Yep. So what we want to do then is look at the emotions of self-deception. In other words, emotions that I have that are just deceiving myself about how I really feel. And let's look at most of those emotions of self-deception. One of the first emotions of self-deception is anger. Right. Now, is anger a loving emotion? No. So I can straight away, any time I'm angry, I know that I'm not in truth. Does that make sense? Straight away. I know whatever it is that's just been presented at me or whatever it is that's been triggered in me, I can't accept this as true. I'm angry. Something's going on inside of me. I need to feel that. What are the other emotions of self-deception? Uh, shame. Now, is shame a loving emotion towards myself? No. So therefore, it has to be an emotion that in the end will disappear from me. Now, I'm not saying to not feel them, am I? Remember that. Now, I'm not saying to not feel these emotions. So I'm saying if you're angry, you need to first connect with your anger to work out what's underneath your anger. You don't need to project it at everyone and sundry. You need to feel it and fully experience it to, to experience the anger. But whatever you're angry about isn't the truth. The fact that you're angry is telling you that it's not the truth because anger is not in harmony with love. Right? So I can be here th feeling like, I'm really upset with you because you told me a lie and I can be blaming you. You told the lie, you're the one I'm upset with and right in that moment I'm in untruth because for a start I'm angry, I'm upset with you. I'm angry with you so therefore I am not harmonious with love, I'm in self-deception. So it's no longer truth. The truth is always loving including loving myself. What about um, emotions of self-deception that might be um, positive, like feeling, you know, say for example, I meditated a lot or I, 
I feel like I'm in a state of bliss and so, you know, I'm in bliss. But you have other tools at your disposal to tell you whether that's a true state or not. The law of attraction is a tool at your disposal that will tell you that. So, for instance, we were talking, I was talking with Josh a few weeks ago. Is Josh here today? I don't think he is. Um, but we were talking together about his emotions about when he, he was doing the Zen thing all the time. He would, he would meditate himself into emotions of bliss and he felt bliss most of the time. But then I said, well, what happened in your day-to-day -day life? He said, oh, during that time my car broke down, my computer was stolen and, <laughs> and all these other things happened, right? But he still experienced bliss. And I'm saying, no, no, rewind, rewind, rewind. No, how come your car was stolen or your computer was stolen? How come your car broke down? Right? How come all these events happen? This is a soul attraction. So look at the soul attraction. But again, if I'm truthful with myself, I will always be emotional about the attraction. Remember, the truth is always emotional. So when I'm trying to detune myself and go into the intellectual state to get away from my emotion, I am no longer being truthful with myself about my emotion. Does that make sense? I'm basically using my intellect to suppress my emotion. But I've said truth is always emotional. You will not arrive at truth without feeling your emotion. So the truth is you can zen yourself out and you can do a lot of very powerful things with your mind to detune yourself from your soul. But that's not emotional, that's now intellectual. And the truth so is that, always emotional. Sorry. So that state of bliss is actually deceptive because that's not yes, real Yes, and bliss. there's many people on this planet today who are in that state of bliss and really all that's happening is they're going out of body so they don't have to connect to their body, they don't have to connect to their life, they don't have to connect to their emotions. And they, spare, they experience hours and sometimes days and sometimes months in that state. I, I know people who are full of physical ailments, like their body is full of pain, like, like holes in their legs or you know, maybe even cancer in their body and yet they feel they're in a state of bliss. And the only thing I can say is that they're lying to themselves because in the end, do you think your body would be in that disharmonious mess if your soul was in harmony with God's laws of the universe? Of course not. So looking at the law of attraction is very important really as a guide. Certainly. For... And we've talked about that before, yeah. obviously. Remember yeah. I've said to you that your law of attraction is actually a messenger of God for you to take notice of, definitely. And I'm not discounting that by saying these things. What I'm saying is remember the way that we can build on truth is that the truth is always loving us and always emotional. Right? So you have lots and lots of experiences in your life that the Law of Attraction brings into you and a lot of emotions that the Law of Attraction will bring to you. The ones that will finish up settling in your soul are the ones that, if we apply this, are the ones that are loving to myself, to my neighbour, to my partner, to God, to animals, to creatures and all of them will be emotions that I actually feel, not just an intellectual thought. I'll actually have this passionate, desirous emotion along with that. The other ones that will enter us. The other ones will all just pass through us and, and in the end we'll experience them and release them from our life and they'll be gone. And they'll be gone, all the false belief will be gone and all the fear attached to that false belief will be gone and all the fear of our own emotions that are painful will all be gone. All the pain will also disappear. So that obviously truth is always loving means that truth is never painful as well. Right? And we could start saying lots of different things about truth here, couldn't we? Like, truth has so many qualities. I've, I've listed in the uh, talk qualities of divine truth, like 15 major qualities of God's truth and how it affects your life. Now, now the truth has lots of different attributes and qualities and I'm just mentioning only a couple of them here. As a method of you, just a simple method of you being able to say to yourself, all right, should I accept this truth, what I, you know, this information, should I accept this information coming to me as truth or not? <coughs> well, does it sound loving to you right at the moment? If it does, then allow yourself to be open to accepting it. I'm not saying you have to accept it, just allow yourself to be open to accept it. Does that make sense? 
if the, and if the truth is an emotional thing or is it all intellectual, is it all mind-based, if it's mind-based, just put it aside for a bit until it becomes an emotion for you. You don't have to dismiss it. You don't have to say that's wrong, that's right, right at this point. It's a learning process. Allow yourself to just allow yourself to see the principles of the truth is emotional, the truth is always loving. And the ones that seem to be loving at the moment, put to one side and say, this is my preferred truth list. It hasn't entered me just yet because it hasn't entered me emotionally, but I, I think this is loving at this point. And allow yourself to feel that. Now, many of you don't feel that it's loving for, for somebody to tell you the truth. And the reason why that is, is because a lot of pain is associated inside of you when you hear it. But where did this pain come from? Well, the truth is the pain come from because remember I said inside of your soul you've got all of these little zigzags everywhere where the error is the preferred condition. So anything outside of that is going to feel painful. Right? And I need to be aware that while I'm in this mess emotionally inside of myself that causes me to have a preferred preference for false belief, I am obviously going to be avoiding my pains, using these false beliefs to avoid my real emotional pains. So I need to be aware of that and say to myself, all right, I can't determine whether something's truthful or not by my own feeling of pain because my own feeling of pain is um, like dependent upon how much error I have. Right? And this is where we get into so much trouble because most of the time we, feel gravita we gravitate towards the beliefs that cause us less emotional pain. But if the truth is always emotional, that also means that the truth may often be emotionally painful. That's what it will feel like to you when, you fit, when it hits you. And if you're avoiding your emotional pain, you're not being truthful to yourself. And the truth is if we allowed ourselves to stop avoiding our emotional pain, we would get more emotional about all sorts of subjects. Right? that we need to feel our way through and release before the truth can enter us. So understand that the system that you've created inside of your own soul, and by the way, it's not just your creation, it's the creation of all your environment and all your growing up and your parents and their environment and their growing up and all of this multi-generational error being pushed upon your soul. But in the end, it's now your responsibility because it's your soul and all this stuff that's in your soul can be very much based around withholding from yourself your own very painful emotions. Right? That's our goal. And if our goal now, if we release that goal from us and our goal instead becomes, I am going to feel all of my emotions, which was yesterday's discussion about humility. Right? If I'm humble, I will feel every emotion. If I feel every emotion, then I will arrive at the truth in the end. And all I need to do is start to trust that, have faith in that process. That I will arrive in the truth in the end as long as I'm prepared to feel every single emotion within me, whether it's pleasurable or painful. That's what will happen within myself. Yeah? So, Paula, you had a question? And no? <laughs> okay. Raya? And then um, we can go up to Graham. Okay. Um, there's been a lot happening in the last couple of weeks, AJ, and yep. uh, now I'm confused. So confusion is a good state uh, based on an error inside of yourself. Go right. On. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. So I thought something was like clearing, but now I'm thinking I was just in, in just stuck in anger, and that nothing was really moving, but it felt like something was moving. And uh, remember, is that I'm not loving? saying here. I'm not saying here to not feel your emotions of anger. Okay. Remember that. I'm saying that when I have an emotion of anger, it's because I have some beliefs that are untruthful. Right. That I I'm know not, that. That are not truth. Okay. I'm not saying don't experience your anger. We have whole weekend talks about experiencing right. Your anger, right? Okay. What I'm saying is you need to still experience your anger. You need to feel your own anger and own it. Yeah. And as that emotion passes through you, you know from this that that emotion is not truth yet. Right. That's not the truthful emotion. That's not the truthful state. It's a feeling you're going to have to feel, but it's not truth yet. 
truth will come as that emotion leaves you and then the underlying emotion which will be fear enters right. you and you'll start trembling about what oh, yeah. the whole Big issue. Time. But that's still not truth yet either. Right. Okay. You need to allow yourself to feel that emotion and that, past, that might take a week, two weeks, three weeks, who knows? It just depends on what you're afraid of as to how much fear there will be and why you're afraid. And then as that emotion passes through, now the grief might hit you of what you were afraid of and therefore right. what you were trying to deny with your anger. And when you feel that grieving emotion and that passes through, and grief isn't truth either yet. Okay. Because I'm, I'm sad about something and in the end if you're at one with God, do you think you're going to be sad? No. No. So, so I've got, but I've got to feel that emotion too. So I allow that emotion to pass through me. And what happens after all of that? All the grief is gone and the grief was being suppressed by my fear and that's gone. And the fear was being suppressed by my anger and that's gone. So what's left? Now what's left is love and the truth. Okay, I didn't get to that part yet, I guess. I, I got to the place of being terrified that I was going to stay stuck. Spot on. So what you've done is you've got from your anger down to your fear, but you're not yet at the causal, but you're in the process of getting there. I'm sliding in there, huh? Yeah, so don't, okay. don't stop it. Don't stop it. Keep the process going because you know I'm going to keep this process going and going and going and going until I arrive at that loving, truthful place which I know is the truth. So I developed some uh, self-deception in the midst of it all because I went, aha, I've arrived somewhere. So that was a false belief also. And this is why you're confused. See, yeah. the mind goes, oh, I want this anger to be the end of it. That was it, yeah. Right? I, I was so and freaked. It, it's not the end of it. Okay. Because otherwise there'd be no fear. And the fear's not going to be the end of it either. Okay. Because there'll be no grief. And if once there's no grief, no fear, no anger, now we're at the end of it. And then we'll be happy. Of course. <laughs> of course you won't have grief in you, you won't have fear in you, you won't have anger in you, so how can you not be happy? Okay. Right? So can you see how we need to just keep sliding in down through this system? And yeah. But we understand at the end, see, what a lot of people do is they get angry and then they think that's truth. I have a right to be angry. This person did the wrong thing to me. They did this, they did that. So they then think they're in truth. They think they're right. right. But they're not right because they're angry. Right. And they have stopped the process of going deeper down into the fear, deeper down into the emotion. They've stopped that entire process. And the indication that they've stopped it is, is anger loving? No. No. Okay. So therefore I'm not in a state of truth yet. No. Does right. that make sense? I, yeah. I'm getting from one state, which is from total denial of my emotion, down into this other state of feeling the underlying causal emotion of grief right. and releasing that. But after I release that, I am going to be in the state of truth on that particular issue. Okay. Right? That's coming, huh? And that's also the place of forgiveness yeah. that people talk about. It's also these, like there's a, lot of there's a lot of things linked to that place of truth. Right. That's where you can be loving to others no matter what they do to you. When, some, when somebody brings up a situation that's similar, you can talk about your own situation with freedom and you don't feel like you know, like you want to get angry with them because they've brought up something that's painful to you because it doesn't feel painful anymore. You don't feel any personal pain left in it about the whole process. That's the, where you arrive at the end and that is the place of truth. Can you be partway there and still have some awarenesses and, but well, still be in the anger? Totally, totally. Yeah, okay. Remember this is a, a process of progression from one, from one place yeah. to another place. So you're not going to get from one place to another place without doing the journey. Right, right, okay. Right? You need to do the journey and the journey is going through the anger, going through the fear, feeling and experiencing each one, and then going down into the grief, feeling and experiencing that. And then when you're out of that, you'll be at the place of truth. But you see, a lot of us go into confusion because we want ourselves intellectually to be at this place or be beyond that place, the place of truth or love, and so we try to manufacture that place yeah. without going through the process. Yeah, okay. And that's like saying, I start my journey here on the Sunshine Coast, I want to go to say Adelaide, and so what I decide to do is I'm going to go bang, bang. And at the moment, that's not very possible for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it was a spirit, we could do that, but we can't do it in our physical body. But we sit there, and so we decide, ah, oh, where I am is where I have to be because I don't want to, I want to get there instantly. And so most of us have this viewpoint inside of us that unless I'm there already, then, uh, then, then I'm not a good person and mm. I'm, not, you know, I'm not happy and I'm not a good person and I'm, 
you know, other people will condemn me. And so what we try to do is we try to make out we're there while we're still here. Right. So just imagine doing that. We sit down there imagining that we're in Adelaide even though we're on the Sunshine Coast, right? <laughs> and that's what we do with our emotions. Yeah, okay. We sit here trying to imagine that we're, you know, we're in Adelaide when in reality we're still on the Sunshine Coast. We haven't moved yet, right? And what we need to do is see that actually this process of movement is going through this anger and rage and hatred first a lot of times and then anger and rage and then right down into this fear-based, you know, terror and fear and then, and then into the grief, which is a lot of the causal emotions are all the grieving stuff. And then we get beyond that and we enter this place where we know we've arrived at truth now. Okay. And in that place, you're not angry anymore, you're not afraid anymore, you're not crying anymore either. Yeah. Right? That's the place we we're aiming for. But don't get, get trapped into thinking right, that I should be there before you've gone through this whole process. Many of us, what we do is we say to ourselves, oh, I dealt with lots of anger last week. Wasn't that wonderful? Like, I'm over the anger now. Yeah, and you haven't yet dealt with your causal emotion. I thought I did it last week and then I got in the car after we left here yesterday and there it was in my face again. Exactly. And I went, son of a gun, I thought I did this. Exactly. So you stop thinking that you've done it. I, okay, well, you gotta I, give I up, promise. You've got to give up the idea that you think you're finished with something. Because at the end, you won't even think about it when you're finished with it. Yeah. As soon as you think you're finished with something, you're not finished with it. Because when you actually finish with it, you don't even think about it anymore. Does that make sense yeah. to everyone? Yeah. It's very important to understand those things. Um, Graham and then Alex. Um, you mentioned before, uh, have faith in the process. Um, how does uh, faith in that sense, um, like in what way is that different or is it different from the sort of faith that Christians talk about? Um, it's different in that you can do it through experimentation. Your faith is actually built through your own experimentation. So let's talk about the faith in the process. How do I have faith in something that I haven't yet tried? Well, obviously I can't, can I? So in that state, that's my hardest state. So I hear all this stuff, sounds good sometimes, the emotion stuff doesn't sound that good, you know. I ask a few of our people around, they're saying, yeah, I've had terrible last week. Oh, I don't know if I want to have a terrible last week. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm relatively happy how I am. And so we go through all these doubts first and all of this emotional stuff first and then we get to arrive to the point where, yeah, let's give it a go. When you arrive to that point, treat it like an experiment. You're going to get right into your emotions about at least one of the subjects that your law of attraction is bringing to you. So you, whatever the law of attraction. Let's say you're going along the road, Somebody cuts you off, just a simple law of attraction event, right? And you feel anger. So you're going to go into this now. Instead of avoiding it and just swearing at the person and then, you know, stopping there, what we're going to do now is we're really going to not avoid this situation. I'm going to experiment. So when I do my first experiment and my experiment comes out at the end and I realise, wow, I'm driving along the road and nobody cuts me off anymore. Wow, in fact, I'm driving along and people seem to just automatically move out of my way. This is real weird. Like, now I can see my law of attraction has changed and that experiment might have created, and we say might have created, that change in my law of attraction. So now my faith starts to build. Does that make sense? Now I've got one event that happened by processing emotion. I've got one event that happened that seems to have changed in my life. So what I do is I try some more of it. So I go down some more roads of experimenting with my emotion and seeing what changes. So let's say I'm having trouble in my relationship or I'm having trouble with my work situation or whatever it is in my life, then I start, instead of doing my normal effect-based stuff, I decide to deal with my causal emotion and I go through my anger and I go into my fear and then I through my fear and into the other deeper emotion and, oh, my law of attraction has changed on that one as well now. That's two things now. Now, what's your faith going to feel like now? Can you see that it will be a bit stronger, won't it, than what it was when only one thing was dealt with or none thing, no things were dealt with? And then I start wondering, well, what about this prayer to God thing? You know, I don't know if even I believe in God or anything like that, but let's experiment with that as well. We might as well experiment. You know, can't, can't hurt anything. Let's see what happens. 
And so what we do is we go into this state of experimenting with that as well. All right. What I'm going to do is I say to God, if you exist, I would like to receive some of your divine love. Nothing happens. And then I remember, oh yeah, that's right, I have to be emotional. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, how do I get emotional on this subject? This is a bit tricky, so I might have to experiment with this for a few weeks or a few months even, right, to be emotional. So what I start doing is I start reading some books, maybe about God or about life or whatever, that are emotional. And then when I'm in the emotion, I feel for God. And then see what happens. And oh, I feel something change there. Does that make sense? And I can experiment with that. And then over a few months, I notice, hey, I actually feel a little happier than I felt before. And of course, the reason why many of you are not feeling a little happy is because we're still stuck in the fear area rather than processing the emotion. See, when you process the emotion, of course, you're going to feel happier after the emotion is released. But if you stay in your fear, you're not going to feel very comfortable at all in that place. That's why you spent most of your life trying to get out of your fear, right? Because it's not comfortable in it. <laughs> And we need to go through it into the grief and grieve the emotion. And, and once we've released that, then we can judge how we really feel. Now, as that all starts to unfold, our faith will build. And as we receive divine love, our faith will actually start building as well. You will actually know you're having a connection with God after a while. But at the start, it's the most difficult because that's when we have the least amount of faith, the least amount of experience, the least amount of trust in all of these different things that we're learning. So does that mean it's like the opposite of the Christian concept of faith? Yes. Where, where things like in, in the Christian concept, bad things can happen to you and you just write them off as God's will sort of thing. Yes, and that's certainly the opposite to that. You certainly wouldn't do that. Because it, if bad things are happening to me, I've got to, I've got to look at why are bad things happening to you. When, when I say bad things are happening to you, I mean how are you feeling about the bad things that are happening to you so if you're feeling triggered, or you're feeling hurt, or you're feeling angry, or you're feeling afraid, or you're feeling, all of those things are just emotional attractions. So, you know, we need to deal with them. It's, and faith is actually the opposite concept to what most Christians say, because most Christians talk about blind faith. True faith isn't blind at all. It, it, has, it is purely based on complete substance, because you have proof in your life. And this is, and there's a message in the Paget message that talks about building upon the truth. Right? And what happens is when you have one experience, you can say, well, that was one experience. Let's see if I can replicate that experience. And down the track we experience other emotions. There's another experience. Oh, okay, now we're starting to get a pattern, right? And if we have 5, 10, 15, 20 experiences, now there's a real pattern developing. And now we can ask ourselves, is this pattern loving? And is this pattern emotional? Yes and yes. Well, therefore, there must be some truth in this stuff. So what I'll do is I'll retain these patterns in my memories emotionally and I'll hold on to those, when I say hold on, I'll remember the experience of these emotional events. And, and I will build upon them as a basis or as a foundation for truth. You see, what happens with most of us is we have one thing happen then, right, and we have another thing happen then and we think the two events are totally unrelated to each other and we don't build on them as, and we don't sum them together as the total experience. What we do is we treat them as two isolated incidences. But you see, if we started adding them together, we started picking them up and started adding them together, we now start you know, to get a collection of events that we're building truth on, right? And once we've got a collection of events, we can now say like, okay, it's not just one isolated instance where this has happened, where I've seen the law of attraction at work. Now I've seen it happen this week five times, that it's to I've noticed it five times. And trust me, in the end, you'll notice it every single minute of your living life. But, but it's great to go through the process of noticing it five times in one week. Wow. What? What, now I can experiment. Oh, okay, I was triggered there with that emotion. Let myself go into that emotion. What's going on with that emotion? And experiment and see what happens. Now as you see the results of what happens, what's going to happen is that things will change in your life and that will prove to you that your faith was justified. There's no such thing as blind faith. In the end, everything that you have faith in about, if it doesn't happen, then you need to discard it. Does that make sense? 
but make sure you're practicing it in the loving and emotional way before you discard it. See, most of us go down the track, oh, we try to connect to our emotions, oh, you're six months later, still not connected to one, you give up now. That wasn't the truth. No, the whole path is dependent upon the emotions. You need to be in an emotional state, so you need to try for longer than that. Until you get to the state where you're processing through your emotions, now measure the results. Now, you can see in your own audience, those of you who have heard this truth for like the last 18 months or so, you can see in the audience, you can measure the changes in other people, can't you? Mm -hmm. All of you have noticed, right? You remember when Jen was dominating every one of our talks? You remember that? <laughs> what happens now? Does that happen now? No. So how much change has she made? Quite a lot of changes, right? You remember that every single one of you would often, and many of you had terrible projections at Jen. You remember that? Yep. Remember how upset you got with her and angry you got with her at times? You remember that? Do you get that happening now when somebody tries to dominate the conversation in our, one of our talks? Many of you don't, right? So what happened inside of you? Something must have changed too, right? Something emotional must have changed. And you notice the ones who are more connected with their emotion and working through things more rapidly, you notice how fast they're changing. Can you see they're changing quite rapidly? Now, it's not a competition. It's just a way of actually saying, yeah, there you go, that person I know is on the path and they're processing their stuff really rapidly and look how much they've changed. Mm. Can you see? Mm. That's interesting. Alex. AJ, I seem to get to a point I avoid because I can't become overwhelmed because I've got 10 different emotions going during the day yep. of which I've worked through varying levels. Yep, sort of so like halfway through this one, quarter yeah, way through yeah, that yeah. one. And then I just go, well, at the end of the day, I'm just like going, which one's this about? How far have I got? What, what is going on? I would just uh, give up. Yeah, yeah. Right. The yeah. key is to not give up at that point, mm -hmm. right? What's going to happen eventually, and this is one thing that you need to understand about your soul as well. Your soul is this amazing emotional processing machine. Not only that, it's this amazing creation machine as well, but that's a different subject in its own right. It's an amazing emotional processing machine, capable of far more than what you believe it's capable of. And remember I said yesterday, unless you're overwhelmed, you won't change. Remember I said that? Remember I said the soul needs to be overwhelmed in order to grow, right? So what I need to do is come to say, all right, that makes logical sense to me that my soul needs to be overwhelmed to expand. In other words, it's only when I try to force more into it that it's, if it's an elastic rubber, if you think of it like in a, a big balloon that you're pumping full of air, you're forcing more air into it and what's it going to do? It gets bigger. And you're afraid that it's going to go, Bang! You know, like, <laughs> that's what you're afraid of, right? God doesn't design things that way. Like, God doesn't design things to go bang. God designs things to completely be elastic and, 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 and change and, and merge into its environment. That's why the whole evolution process comes about, right? So, what we need to do is we need to understand that God doesn't design things that, that can't cope with being overwhelmed. The truth is that all of you are totally able to cope with being overwhelmed. When I say cope, you won't feel like you're coping at the time. That's the whole point. That's what the word overwhelmed means, right? But your soul is totally able to cope with these emotions. The problem is, is that oftentimes we believe intellectually that we're not going to cope with this, right? And there goes one of our fears and one of our beliefs that are false. Right? Another one being confronted. Gee, I've got a long list of them, right? And what happens is that well, as that belief gets confronted in me, I start to come to the point of understanding that actually I can handle being overwhelmed with anything. Now that is a very powerful state for your processing. And that state is only going to be arrived at by being overwhelmed on quite a number of things at the same time, which is exactly the experience your soul is creating. You understand? But what we do instead most of the time is we get into this fear place and we start shutting down this process, start, shutting, start trying to manage the process of growth. 
And God says to you, look, mate, I've got the process all under control. And what you're trying to do now is you're just trying to take over control of something that I designed perfectly, right? And in it, all, it, all that the issue really is, is I do not have God reliance yet. And I need to talk to God about that. I need to talk to God about how I feel when I'm feeling overwhelmed. And in the end, you'll come to develop a really powerful relationship with God in that space. And you'll come to understand and have so much internal strength of character that you know you're going to be able to never be overwhelmed because God is always with you through the process. And God, in fact, not only is with you through the process, but God actually designed the process and designed your soul to handle the process. And in the end, you'll come to that conclusion. But only if you allow yourself to go through all these emotions of being overwhelmed uh, you know, five or ten things at the same time. So my suggestion is when you feel that place of being overwhelmed, let yourself start to connect with some of the joy in that state. And part of the joy in that state is the realisation you have, my soul's expanding, right? I'm changing at last, <laughs> right? Instead of going around keeping my soul in this particular space in, and in this particular place and in this particular time, what I'm doing now is my whole conception of life is changing. That's what I've been aiming for, hasn't it? So why am I trying to shut it down now? You know, so, so what we do is we spend most of our life going, we want change, we want bliss, we want to be connected with God. And then as soon as God begins the process with it, we say, no, 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 let's go get back down, get back down to where we were before. Like, and we need to stop doing that and just allow us to even say the no, 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 but go ahead with the whole thing. You know what I mean? That's what we need to do. Jen? Um, during the break, I felt a truth and... As I began to speak it out, um, it became coloured with anger. Is so that that blocked the whole process? Yep, and because because while it may have been an external truth, right? It was not something yet that you were at, at yet at the loving place yet. So that means there is far more error in this still for you. Does that make sense? So does that mean that original feeling of truth that I began to speak out was in error also? No, no, no. Um, let me illustrate this. Let's say... Um, I'm overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed. That's really good, Jen. I'm impressed. Yeah. Go for the overwhelmed. It's always good. Let's uh, look at what's really going on, shall we, in terms of what's happening for most of us emotionally. We start off emotionally in complete denial. Right? Complete <laughs> denial. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then, then um, I've actually written about this. There's some stuff that's downloadable on the net. I can't remember what it's called, so I can't point in the right direction. <laughs> but um, it's about the process of emotional or soul o opening and realising what happens is after complete denial, which is a both emotional and intellectual denial, in other words, we're not even intellectually aware that we have an emotion that we're denying. And then we start hearing some of the laws of God and, you know, seeing firstly the law of attraction. So, wow, the law of attraction hits me. Oh, okay, that event happened and what, from what AJ said to me, um, in the past, that that means that I must have an emotion. <laughs> I don't know, I haven't got one, I can't feel it, but, but you know, it's happened, the event happened, right? And the event was a painful event, <clears throat> and it happened, and so uh, something must be going on. So let's assume that I must have an emotion. So then you could say we become, <coughs> excuse me, aware, <coughs> intellectually, <clears throat> All right. Doesn't do me much good, of course, being aware intellectually. In fact, it seems to make it worse. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah. Every time you become intellectually aware that you've got an emotion, all of a sudden the emotion seems to be present all the time. Yeah. That's a bit of a problem, so we don't <laughs> like that state very much. So uh, a lot of times that's where we try to shut things down. 
I'm just going to have a cough and a drink. Where is my water went? I must have taken it with me somewhere. <clears throat> mustn't want to talk about this. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Can I ask a question while you're thinking? I'm not thinking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you should know by now I never think in these things. <laughs> I'll give it a shot anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm having something's just come up for me. You're right in front of me, which is really good because I'm going to go for it. Yep. Can a man share the same space with another man or woman who have two, don't have the same truth? And is that loving? Example, if I was to go to my yoga centre, yep. now not believing in reincarnation, yep. and it's not your fault, yep. it, it's... <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> There's an emotion there. Um, but... After nine months of, of hearing this beautiful body of knowledge, yep. my awareness has gone to this other place. Yep. And I want to share this truth with these beautiful people who, are, whether they're on the natural love path or the divine love path, they're probably not aware of it, that yep. there's a difference. Yep. But I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, if you have two different truths, can you still share the same environment and it's, it's still uh, allowing God to, uh, for you to receive love through yeah, God. Yeah, of course. Right. So, see, this is the beauty of the divine truth. See, with natural love truths, it's very, very hard for two people with totally op opposing natural love ideas to get together in a frequently harmonious manner. Proof of point is Ireland, right? So you've got Catholics and Protestants who actually aren't very far away in beliefs, <laughs> are they really? Right? And yet they cannot coexist together. Right, because of anger and resentment with each other. And of course, there's a lot of core emotions in all of that. The truth is, though, that when you receive divine love into your soul, you can coexist with everything, everyone, and have no trouble doing that at all. But what you do, you don't force truth down people's throats, but when they ask for truth to be given, or the situation demands truth to be given, which is most of the time, then you say it. <laughs> right? And so, so what you do is you live in your truth that you know now all the time. And that automatically is, does beautiful things. It automatically brings in your law of attraction and all the people who want to hear that truth are attracted to you. You don't have to force them to hear because they want to hear, right? Like, I haven't forced you to come, have I? I can't remember forcing you to come anyway. I can't remember holding a gun to your head. Might have done that in the spirit world, but I don't think so. And, and, and you came along anyway, right? And the reason why you came along anyway is because you were felt an attraction to the body of truth as you, as you stated it. And that's what will happen to your friends. As you practice the truth and bring the truth harmoniously into your life emotionally, not intellectually, but emotionally, that creates a dynamic that wherever you go, people want to talk to you, but they don't know why. But they talk to you anyway. And before you know it, they, they're saying, they're bearing their heart to you and you can talk to them about a principle, the law of attraction or the cause and effect or, or divine truth or divine love. And those situations come up automatically because you're in that state that attracts those particular events. So you don't even have to go out and seek an audience. The audience actually seeks you. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So let's get back to the process. What happens is I'm here in complete denial, I become aware intellectually. Awareness intellectually does nothing, aside from just ramping up my law of attraction a little, because I'm now allowing myself to see what's happening. So I'm aware intellectually. But I still may have lots of soul-based denial. And I'll go through a process of even getting to the point where, and, and I, rather than listing everything that happens, because it's in outline thing that I did, it might be down at five or six or something like that, I get to the point where I want intellectually to feel the emotion. <laughs> Many of you are there, right? You want intellectually to feel the emotion, but it still ain't happening thing, right? That's a very frustrating place, isn't it? 
yeah, those of you who are there know that it's a very frustrating place. While all of that intellectual awareness and development is necessary for you to arrive at this state, it still isn't going to help you feel one of your emotions. And that's the problem with our intellect, is that it's not powerful enough to shift our emotions. Right? Then we go through a whole process emotionally, which begins, so you could say this is point number seven really, but it's an emotional process now. So here is the intellectual process that happened. We were in complete denial of our emotion. You see, the truth is that if you want to intellectually feel the emotion, but you're not feeling the emotion, there's a truth you need to accept. And that is, I am still in complete denial <laughs> of the emotion emotionally. In other words, emotionally. No. In other words, I, even though I think I want to feel emotion, have deep emotional resistance to feeling the emotion. And that's what we've called, I've said to you, is the blocking emotions. You remember we've talked about those. Now, anger is one of those, a blocking emotion. Fear is another blocking emotion. Understand we do need to feel our blocking emotions. We need to allow ourselves to go through the emotional process of our denial. Emotionally, not intellectually, emotionally. Doubt is a blocking emotion. There's lots of blocking emotions and we need to feel them. And when we feel the blocking emotion, now we can go through a process of emotional growth which is the soul expansion, the real thing that happens, emotional growth that ends up with us actually feeling the causal emotion. Now, I think, I think there are about seven or eight steps to that, so let's put that down about 13 or 14 or whatever, where we actually feel the emotion. And after we feel the emotion, we even have some more steps that actually happen to us soul-wise. We embrace the new truth at that point. Right? So because remember, it's the causal emotion that prevents us from embracing the truth. Right? We've said that in this discussion. So if the causal emotion is preventing the embracement of truth, then once I feel the causal emotion, which is the, which is the block to truth, if you like, that gets ripped out of me, gone, and now the truth can actually enter me quite easily. Now many of you have experienced this with my example, the law of reincarnation for example. When you first heard me speak, no, reincarnation, no, no, I can't accept that, I can't accept, no, no, I can't accept that, um, and you've gone down the track of, no, no, I don't want to see the guy again, no, no, that reincarnation is the truth, as I know it, it's the truth, and that's the way it is. And then a whole series of events occurred over your life, I wasn't even in your life in this time, for many of you have done this, and a whole series of things happened that started triggering this particular thought, maybe he's right, maybe he's right. And then I found six months later a lot of people come and say, you know, I've worked through all the emotions and now I realise you're right. And in fact, many of you have come to me 12 or 18 months later and said, oh, you know how you said that nine months ago or a year ago? It turned out to be right. And I didn't expect you to take it on right there and then, just me stating it to you created an opening inside of your soul to actually investigate it, even though you might have had a lot of denial to, to investigating it. And that's the beauty of truth, you see. The beauty of truth is that you can just say it to somebody and just leave it there like a thing hanging in the air. And it just hangs there, hangs there, hangs there. And, you know... It's like, you know how sometimes around the house, I don't know if you've ever had this, but you've always had, uh, like sometimes you get a house where there's a little ledge that you always finish up banging your head on. Like, <laughs> no matter what happens, you, you try to avoid it, but you finish up banging your head on it anyway, and after a while you decide to cut the whole thing out, you know, just <laughs> get rid of it. And that's often what happens with the truth. You see, the truth is just like this little annoying thing at the start. It's <laughs> bing, bing, you know, like annoying sounds. You know, you know like the dripping of a tap, you know. You know. You know, and, it, and it's this real slow drip at night, you know. 
you know what it's like after a while, don't you? Like, you're just about at the sleep place and it happens again. Right? Now, this is very much what, what the truth is like to you, you see. You know, you, you're, just at, you're at the place of almost getting to deny that truth. It happens again. Like, and almost getting to deny it again. And it happens again. Why is that happening? Because, like, this is the beauty of the truth, you see, and the way the law of attraction works and the way your soul desire works is if you have a real soul desire to experience truth in the end, the truth will just keep dripping at you like a leaking tap. And after a while, you won't be able to ignore it. Right? And that's the beauty of it. So, so you can present the truth, just drop it in the air like that, and, and six months, 12 months, 18 <coughs> months later, somebody comes to the realisation. And that's the beauty of the truth. It's just like that dripping tap letting you know that it's still there, and there's still a problem inside of you. You're still attracted to this, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it just happens like that all the time, right? Where we, just do, we can feel that soul-based attraction just drawing us in. And then we go down the track of going, oh, just, I'm worried about this AJ character though, you know. And then we work through a lot of those things and we're worried about this cult thing. And what about the, the community? Gee whiz, like, AJ, where did you get all that money to buy the community? Like, wh what have... I never bought nothing, like... But they don't, you know, we go through all of those emotions, right? And in the end we get to the point where, wow, I'm starting to see some of these truths now in my own life. And then we start to, it gels with us and we start to feel them inside of us emotionally. Now none of that process will happen if somebody didn't just drop the truth there and leave it there dangling in the air for us to come to terms with at some point. And this is the beauty of you, now that you know some truth, just dropping the truth in the air and leave it dangling for someone else to grab hold of. And those who feel the desire for truth in them will just be attracted to that. Yeah? Okay. I have something inside of me and I don't know even how to express it. I'll try and do it simply. You mean you have a feeling inside of you, Jen? I'm oh. sorry, I'm in a jo joking state now, so I'm, it's, it's I just okay. got to get out of it. It's okay. Just look. That's, no. That's better now. Now I'm better. <laughs> um, it's like I feel truth, yeah. but I also feel my own soul damage. And so it's like the two of them are coexisting at the same time. So I get a feeling <coughs> of truth yep. and speak it out out of my soul damage, yep. which dilutes it. And I'm really totally confused as to whether I'm doing the right thing yep. or the wrong thing or the right thing and the wrong thing all at the same time. <laughs> yep. And I... Do you understand? Totally, yep. Let's look at what's happening at the soul level. Because it's always at the soul level, the important thing, isn't it? So what's happening is that I've, I've now got truth trying to enter me and error trying to leave me and it's all happening at the same time. And the beauty is your soul can handle all of that at the same time. It's just your intellect can't. <laughs> right? This is a, this is, you feel it happening, yep, that's right. I feel it happening yep. at the same time and it's really... Um... But there's a basic truth that we need to understand about the soul as well. And it, to be frank, it's a basic truth about the universe. But let's look at the soul. Here's our soul. Remember our soul? It's getting real round now. <laughs> pudgy soul, pudgy soul. Right? It's getting real round now, and because our soul is expanding, right, like a pumped up balloon. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we're really expanding, emotionally expanding. Now, remember we've got those two influences. What are? So, yep, so we've got the error based influences and the truth based influences. Uh -huh. And inside of our soul, there's truth and error on different subjects. Does that make sense? So there's some subjects of which I am, have the truth on inside of my soul, but there's other subjects that I have an error on inside of my soul. But one truth that we need to understand about the soul is that it cannot have the same subject and truth and error at the same time on the same subject. 
It, has the, uh, it can have error about a different related subject, but not about that particular same subject. So in other words, there's a basic principle of truth that's in the Paget messages. It's actually one of the messages you'll find there. And what it is, it says that truth and error cannot coexist in the same location at the same time. And if there is an attempt to be made to hold on to error and accept the truth at the same time, all that eventually happens is an internal explosion right, of confusion. Right, that's what happens. And so, what, every time you're in a state of confusion, this is what we need to understand. Emotional confusion is created by my attempts to accept the truth when I've not yet released the error that prevents that truth from being accepted. So you want me to say that again? Yes, I don't know if I can remember how to say that again, but anyway. <laughs> so, the, so do you understand what I'm saying? The, the reason why that we're not accepting the divine truth on any particular one subject is because the error on that same subject has yet to be released from me emotionally. So why then, why then do I feel the truth and know it and then well, speak it out of Can I illustrate for error? you what's going on for some of your emotions? Okay. Right, let's look at what's going on for some of your emotions. There's an emotional truth that has entered you to not destroy life. Right? There's this emotional truth that's entered you. You really feel that quite strongly. But there's, not a, there's another emotional truth that hasn't entered you, or I should say another emotional error that hasn't left you, and that is people ignore me. Ignore my desires. Right? You know that? You know that one? You can feel that one, right? Yeah. Now, can you see what's going to happen in the, any situation where life is getting destroyed and I speak up and my desires are being expressed and people are going to ignore my desires because that's going to be my law of attraction and what's going to happen inside of myself? I'm going to be in this state where I'm feeling angry about people destroying life. Can you see? You see, if I was in a loving state, would I be angry about people destroying life? No, I wouldn't be, would I? Right. So, what's happened is this emotional truth has entered you without resistance. But this emotional error has not yet left you. And that emotional error, of course, is going to affect many areas of other truths that have entered you. Because every time that your uh, desires get ignored in harmony with truth, you're going to be upset. Does that make sense? And you'll feel that emotion of upset. How do I process people ignore my desires? I have been crying for days. Yep. And I'm feeling it, AJ. Well, the problem is, is that for yourself, you want them to actually, the truth is that you want them to listen to your desires, right? So you have a demand coming from my, your soul saying, listen to me. I'm saying the truth. Don't destroy life. Listen to me. Right? That's the emotion coming from you. Yes. Right? And what's happening is that is actually the error. Not that. That's the, the self-deception. This is the error. The error is that you want people to listen to you and you've got to give it up. So people don't need to listen to me? No, nobody needs to listen to you at all. The truth is you'll get to a point in your life where you don't expect a single other person to listen to you. Does that mean that I stop speaking up? No, but, but at the moment it does because you have this error that unless they listen to me, I'm not going to speak up, right? What I'm saying is you'll get, once you feel this emotion and release it, that, see that is a demand you are placing on the world around you. All demands are unloving. They are expectations. And whenever I expect you to act a certain way towards me and I demand it of you angrily, I am now out of harmony with love. No matter what the situation is about, we could be talking about, you could be talking, uh, we could be talking about an issue where I know that you are being unloving 
Yet as soon as I'm demanding of you to follow what I'm saying to you, I am now unloving you. I have just compromised my own truth. <laughs> right? I've just compromised myself and God's truth by demanding of you that you do something. Because what does God give you? God gave you free will. You're allowed to make a choice that destroys life. So the only way I'm going to get rid of this is for people not to listen to me. Which people are doing. Right? That's so, your law of attraction, right? So people don't listen to me so I can heal this. So that you can heal this. I mean this sincerely. That's right. That's what I'm. So that you can heal this demand that's in your soul, please listen to me, please listen to me. And underneath that is lots of grief that you need to release. Now what you've been doing is grieving the self-deception and not the actual emotion. We do this a lot, right? What we do is we say, people should listen to me, people should, shouldn't ignore my desires. Oh, my desires are being ignored. <laughs> my desires are being ignored. You know, and we go into that space where we're crying for days and days and days about my desires being ignored, when the divine truth is, why do you have an expectation that other people hear your desires? The only person that really has a right to experience your desires is yourself. Right? And that's the truth that needs to enter me and it's not going to enter me while I'm demanding everyone listens to me just to make this addiction go away. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So that's what's going on inside of you, Jen. What's going on inside of you is there are some truths that you have certainly accepted in your soul emotionally, but then there's other errors that are not being released emotionally. And the reason why is because a lot of times you're not looking at the demands you have of others. Right? And this is a common problem, so don't feel that you're unique. A common problem is we all often have very, very strong, intense demands of others here that actually cover over very unloving emotion. This is a very unloving emotion. If I, des if I demand you listen to me, I am now impinging upon your free will, so therefore it's, an act, it's not an act of love, right? So I'll get to a stage in the end where I don't demand anybody listens to me. And when you're in that state, you'll have released the emotion. And when somebody doesn't, you'll still speak the truth. And when somebody doesn't listen to you, no worries. It's like, okay, I know they're not going to listen to me. Nothing else happens inside of you. You don't get upset, you don't get angry, you don't get annoyed, you don't get frustrated, you don't give up, you don't stop speaking this truth because you are allowed to have your own desires. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's a really good place to be. Yeah. I'm just going to change my sides. Far away, here we go. Um, I have a um, desire to do, and um, I feel people go jump in the desire I feel so, um, I want to do that too. Mm -hmm. And flip side, I have jealous. This week, I'm a lot of jealous. Yep. And I'm so happy people doing on the passion, living on the passion. I yep. thought that's beautiful. But in flipping side, I have big jealous. That's unloving. Yep. But again, but go into it emotionally. Accept I'm jealous. So yeah. firstly, when I accept I'm jealous, I go through all the intellectual stuff of oh, I'm jealous, you know, I can see I'm jealous. Yeah. And then I start to go down into feeling jealous, like really feeling it, which is where you are, you're feeling the jealousy, right? Mm. Okay, so what does this feel like? Yucky. Yeah, what Yucky. does it feel like? It feels like I'm missing out, doesn't it? Like, yeah. like that person's got that thing going on, isn't that wonderful? It's great for them, but I'm missing out here. So go into that, I'm missing out emotion. I'm missing out, go deeper and deeper, and you'll find actually jealousy covers over a lot of things. Yeah, I don't know what's underneath, unworthy or anger. Um, um. Yeah, don't try to work out what's underneath. Okay. When right. you experience the emotion of jealousy fully, mm -hmm. just really feel the jealousy that's inside of you, mm -hmm. feel the rage of it and the, the, yeah. the, feeling of, the terrible feelings about it, mm -hmm. then you will start to settle into what's underneath it. And you won't have to work it out. It'll oh. just come up in you. Yeah. 
You sold. This is the thing, you see. Most of us are still trying to work out. Ah, oh, yeah, this emotion is, or that emotion is, and that one, and we're trying to sort of work through. And it's really confusing. And in the end, we end up confused, and we just go, ah, oh. <laughs> sorry, 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 Peter. We just go like that, right? We just throw our hands up, hands up in the air, and just go, I oh, give up, right? When in reality, all we need to do is just feel the emotion that's with us right now, right now. The jealousy is with you right now, so feel the jealousy. Let yourself really go into the jealousy. Get out in the boxing bag, you know, with the baseball bat that you've got and, and actually feel the, the feelings of why have they got it and I haven't got it, you know, and, 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 and all that emotion. And as that emotion comes up, what will happen is what's underneath, the grief of the emotion will rise in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So, so don't try to get away from the jealousy. Don't say to yourself, oh, the jealousy's not loving. Oh, I shouldn't be in this jealous state. And all that does is get you out of it, right? Th this is your pathway into the deeper emotion. It's like your anger. Your anger is the pathway into the deeper emotion. So if you allow your anger, you, it'll come up. So allow these emotions to come up. What about your shame? Allow your shame to come up. You feel the shame rising in you, so let yourself feel ashamed. You know, don't try and run away, get away from your shame. <laughs> like you're carrying the emotion around in your soul. You, you, know, you can run all you like. You're not going to get away from it. <laughs> but, and you see this happen a lot where people go, oh, I'm going to move house. That's going to make me feel better. Move house, nah, not better. Oh, I'm going to change men. You know, that's going to make me feel better. So change my relationship. No, nah, I don't feel better. And we're always constantly trying to change something externally, running away from the emotion inside of us. Right? And instead we just need to embrace the emotion that's inside of us without judgment. So if the emotion is jealousy, go with the jealousy. Just go with that. That's your gateway to the deeper emotion. What are you jealous about? Why are you jealous? What are you feeling? Yep. So when I feel jealous, that's where I go. Into the jealousy, deeper in what am I feeling? And it gets down for me in the feeling that no, my, my soulmate's never going to be able to love me. That's what it feels like in the end. And she doesn't want me. And so it gets down to those emotions. And obviously there's even deeper emotions underneath that. And allow yourself to feel them. Let yourself get to those. Yeah? No worries. <coughs> David, back. So with the, the list you had up before, mm -hmm. and um, you got to, um, or you get to, I think it was six, you want to intellectually feel the emotion, and then the next step was complete denial of the emotion. Is that because the intellect is actually getting in the way of feeling the emotion? No, no, the intellect can certainly get in the way of dealing with the emotion, but we, we firstly, when we start on the process, have this sort of uh, process that we go through where we expand intellectually a bit first before we can actually expand emotionally because our intellect has been used as a powerful way to suppress our emotion. So what we need to do is go through this intellectual process of, oh, yeah, wow, I have emotions. Yep. And what are those emotions that I'm having right now? Oh, I have anger. Yep. You know, and we notice these things intellectually. But even though we get to the state where we want to feel the emotion, where we think we want to feel the emotion, that doesn't mean you're going to feel it. Because it's only when you feel you want to feel the emotion that you will actually feel the emotion. Right? Still just a little bit muddy. When you feel that you want to feel the emotion, that is when you will feel the emotion. So how if do you get you, from... If you think you want to feel the emotion, but the emotion is not being felt, then you do not want to feel the emotion. Right? And I need to accept to myself and say to myself, is that all confusing? Yes, of course. Uh, it wasn't confusing for me. I, anyway, I can't even remember what I said, but it didn't feel confusing. But um, what we need to do is understand that unless, these are all feelings. All of our blockages end up being feelings. They are feeling blockages to deeper emotions. Right? So the reason why we construct feeling blockages is because they are very powerful. They are a very easy way for us to construct inside of ourselves, and, and usually it's our environment that constructs them, that prevents us from feeling underlying painful causal emotion. So what happens is a layer of painful causal emotion enters us, 
And then the feeling blockage enters us. And the feeling blockage might be, I'm not allowed to feel that my parents don't love me. Right? And intellectually I say, well, it didn't feel like love. You know, when they belted me, it didn't feel like love. But I won't emotionally accept that right, until I understand that violence is not loving. There's a blockage inside of me. And when I realise that violence is not loving, then that releases the blockage to actually feeling that my parents didn't love me, which is a causal emotion. Right? And then when I release my parents didn't love me, I'll get to the point where I finish up loving my parents and forgiving them, ironically. But it won't happen until I feel these emotions rather than just think them. And many of us get into the trap of trying to think our way through our emotions. This is why women have it a little bit easier than men when it comes to actually feeling causal emotion because many women think less about their emotions and they allow their feelings to be more present. So this is an advantage you have, my lovely sisters, right, over the male. But of course, that's a generalisation as usual because who knows what little emotional intricacies were created through all of my life that blocked me from feeling my emotions and I've got to deconstruct them just the same as anyone would. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you feel all of your feelings about your emotions, that's when you'll be feeling them. When you're thinking about them, you are not feeling them, you are still blocking them. So would it be an idea to, and perhaps for me particularly in a relatively early stage, is to just let it go a bit? Yep. Let go of the intellectual process of discovery and just concentrate on focusing on feeling what you feel at any moment. So if the feeling is anger, feel the anger and go really into the anger. Stop condemning the anger. Feel the anger. Don't project it at anyone else because that's unloving act. But feel it. Really own it. Get out with the bag and the boxing bag and the guns and really go for it and swear and scream and carry on and do what you want, right? And really get into the anger. But understand right at that moment that the anger is the choice to get away from what you're afraid of, right? So when you've finished releasing all of that anger that was in you, sit down, if you haven't connected with any other emotion, which many times, by the way, if you do that, you will, but if you haven't, ask yourself, what am I so afraid of about this particular thing that made me angry? And allow this, firstly, the process of intellectual awareness expand so that at least some of the emotions can become present. It's the denial, it's the emotional denial of the causal emotion that creates the blocking self-deception emotions. So in the example we gave earlier with um, um, Jen, uh, when we talked about this emotion that was in her that has settled within her as an emotion of truth and this emotion which was her self-deception actually. Right? That was her self-deception. People ignore me, my desires, it was her self-deception. The real emotion she needs to work through is she has a demand that others listen to her and that is unloving. And she needs to look at what's underneath that demand. That's the real causal emotion. Right? And so the, the important thing to understand is with all of these things, that most of the time, when we're in this state, this one is an anger state. So when Jen's in that state, she gets angry with everyone, right? You didn't listen to me. You're destroying life. I'm right. You're wrong. That's the state where we say that. I'm right. You're wrong. But it's not just where we say it. We feel it with all this intensity of anger and rage, generally. I'm right and you're wrong. And in that state, we're in a state of self-deception. Right? Allow yourself to get deeper than that and look at the demands you're placing on other people and then ask what emotions underneath that would create that demand because that's the emotion you need to feel. Right? And when you feel about that, you'll feel some causal events and so forth. But 
initially what's happening for most people is they intellectually try to work all this out rather than feeling their way down. So Jen feel, can feel that emotion, people ignore my desires, but she was unable to feel her demand. And if she could feel her demand, she'd realise that that demand was unloving. But she was blocking that demand with this emotion. Does that make sense? So that became her blocking emotion to feeling the truth about the real thing. And that is, I want you to listen to me and if you don't listen to me, I'm going to get angry with you. Right? That's the real thing. And there's something underneath that. Does that make sense? That's just an example. So would one strategy be, rather than wanting to feel the emotion intellectually, yeah. to just pray to God and just ask for him to, to bring uh, appropriate laws of attraction when appropriate? What's, and a, what's a prayer, David? Isn't a prayer an emotion? Yeah, for me, a, for me a prayer at the moment is an intellectual thing. Okay, well it needs to become an emotion. <laughs> because a real prayer is an emotion. At the moment, when you have an emotion that I don't want to face my other emotions, that's the prayer. That's the prayer you're saying to God and the universe. You're saying to God and all of God's creation, you're saying, help me, don't feel, help me to not feel this emotion. <laughs> that's what you're saying. So you can say intellectually, help me feel the emotion, help me feel the emotion. And in your heart, the real prayer is, don't let me feel this emotion. Please don't let me feel this emotion. And why would I do that? Because I'm afraid of feeling the emotion. And I need to be honest about the truth. If I'm not feeling the emotion right now, I need to say to myself, I don't want to and I'm allowed to not want to. And that's true, isn't it? I don't want to feel this pain, sadness, grief, whatever, and I'm allowed to not want to. The other day, myself and Mary were talking and uh, we were in a really emotional situation down in one of the tents and, and Mary just said, but I'm allowed to not do this, right? And within about two seconds after that, she was in the emotion. It was even just the acknowledgement that she was allowed to deny the emotion that allowed the emotion to come up. And that's happened to me hundreds of times, right? State the truth about the emotions. And what's the time? I must be... Must be 5.35, is it? Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to finish off, actually, because I want to uh, get a few things done tonight <laughs> before we go home. Um, is it on the subject, Katerina? Yes. Fire away. One more question. I have a problem that I, uh, I am very sensitive. I am very emotional all my life. Mm -hmm. And I have a fear, for example, my husband, my kids, or everybody whom I meet and tell them about uh, my feelings or about some, situa some situation mm -hmm. that they have the same feeling. And because of that feeling that they can feel what I feel, I feel horrible in, in a circle. Yeah. Then I have, for example, hide some situation because I am afraid to tell them to others because if they feel what I feel, mm -hmm. that horror, what I have in my body, in my mind, mm -hmm. I want to avoid everyone to know about the situation, to avoid them to feel the feelings yep. I feel. Yep. So what you're really doing is avoiding one of your own emotions, right? See, you feel some horror inside of you about s stuff in your past, right? Okay. Right? That's the emotion. Now that's related to some terror. So you have some terror to work your way through with regard to that group of emotions, right? But what's happening, instead of letting yourself feel that, by, by just speaking the truth about it, come what may, what happens is you start going down the track is I, I want no one else to feel this and so when they ask me how I feel, I don't tell them about my horror. Right? I deny it. 
or I even just say, no, I don't want to tell you about it. I want to, you know, it's ter too terrible for you to consider. What you're actually doing, though, is using that as a tool to suppress your own emotion, the real causal emotion. So what you're doing is you're using your terror, and horror is a subset of your terror, you're using that to suppress what you really feel, the grief that you have about all the things that happened. And what you need to do is stop doing that and just tell the truth to somebody about what happened. The instant you do that, what will happen is this pathway will open up inside of you and you'll experience, you'll release the horror that's still inside of you wrecking you. Does that make sense? Just the speaking of truth to another person will actually release that emotion. So my suggestion is instead of avoiding the horror that's within you, to actually start saying the truth to another person. Now one of the things that you have that's an error in you, a belief that's an error, is that if I tell this horror to someone else, then they'll be horrified. But you know that's not true. The only people that are going to be horrified are the people that had exactly the same thing happen to them who also have not dealt with that emotion. You see, in the end, unless something has happened to me, I cannot know the feeling that you know of what happened to you, unless a very similar event has happened to me. And even if it has, it would be my law of attraction to hear you say your event to help me work through my event. Yeah. So stop trying to modify who you are and stop trying to control your emotions so that other people can benefit. Because they're not benefiting. And you are actually being harmed by it. It's only when you allow all of your emotions to flow that everything will actually work through for you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Thank you. No worries. Um, so hopefully today's discussion has helped all of you with regard to this understanding how these false beliefs have entered you and how fear of your emotions actually creates pathways through your soul, allowing these false beliefs to settle within you. And then also hopefully you can see how the, because of these pathways that have been created in your soul, there is a resistance to emotional truth in you. And that's in a resistance to feeling truthfully all of your own emotions, but also a resistance to accepting divine truth that's there as a part of us. And if we can allow ourselves to see that the key to actually understanding at the soul level divine truth is actually by experiencing all of our emotions and all of our fears that allowed the false beliefs to enter, we will actually arrive at the truth. And you'll destroy false belief after false belief inside of you so rapidly, you'll wonder, you'll wake up in a month's time and you'll think, well, I can't even believe that I believed that, <laughs> let alone believe it again, <laughs> right? You can't even, you can't even, you, you wake up amazed at yourself that you could even have, have, have had a concept inside of you that allowed you to accept that belief. And that's what will happen to you if you allow that process to occur. So hopefully today has been beneficial for you. Oh, there's three things I need to mention. Uh, I don't remember what they are. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, you'll notice that up the back, Peter has now got those printed books of the pageant messages in one volume. So that's been available. There's also, you know, the introductory session that we did down at the Gold Coast? That is now on DVD. Uh, and it's here. So for those of you who want to sort of provide an introductory thing, discussion to somebody else, that's probably an ideal uh, DVD to provide to them. And remember, they're all able to be copied, so you, know, you can copy them as much as you like. And then the third thing was something about child children. Oh, that's right. Um, uh, two weeks' time, I was going to have a, a question and answer session, but what we were going to do for the first bit of the session is open it to children's questions. All right? So even if your children don't want to come along, even if they bring along a, a question that they've written or anything like that, that's fine. And um, what I'd like to do is just open the first half of the day for children and when we run out of children's questions or, or we have the break, then we'll answer the adult questions. Does that sound all right? That'll be happening in two weeks' time on the Saturday. And in two weeks' time on the Sunday is the next mediumship and healing session 
where we're going to experiment a little more with fear and working our way through fears and dealing with fears with regard to our channeling and our healing uh, abilities. So that's the next two sessions. But that was all, wasn't it? Yep. Um, th before you go, there'll be a few announcements, but thank you so much for your time today. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed today a little better than yesterday. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>